Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ingenious Talks Online, Microscopy, Image Analysis, and 3D Bioprinting, Combining Tools to Study Disease Progression and Develop New Therapies. Thank you for joining us today. So my name is Laura Kilpatrick, and I will be serving as the moderator for today's event. While we meet on a virtual platform, we would like to acknowledge the Algonquin Nation whose traditional and unceded territory we are gathered upon today. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Together, please consider how we are and can each, in our own way, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Now we will review a few housekeeping items. So this is a Zoom webinar, which means that all attendee microphones and videos have been automatically disabled. However, you are able to ask a question by typing in the Q&A box on your screen. While questions will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation, we highly encourage you to type them as they come to mind into the Q&A box on your screen. So you don't need to wait until the question and answer period to submit your questions. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but please be mindful that with the high volume of questions, we cannot guarantee that all will be answered. You may also type in the chat box on your screen to talk amongst each other and share ideas. Finally, a brief survey will appear on the screen at the conclusion of the webinar. And if you do have the time to fill it out, we'd really appreciate your feedback. All answers are anonymous. So now I'm pleased to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Leila Mustaso Gwidlin. Dr. Mustaso Gwidlin is an assistant professor with Carleton University's Department of Systems and Computer Engineering and is leading the establishment of the Tissue Engineering and Applied Materials Hub. Her current work is focused on the development and application of imaging modalities to characterize biological tissues, including 3D in vitro models. Dr. Mosasu Gwidlin is a medical physicist by training, working in close collaboration with the National Research Council and holds a PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Manitoba. Her main research area is related to combining microscopy and tissue engineering to better understand changes associated with fibrosis and extracellular matrix remodeling in diseases. Today, she will share how the analysis of microscopy images could help us track changes happening inside of airways due to asthma. She will also discuss how 3D bioprinting technology can be con combined with microscopy to construct simplified models of complex biological systems and help us understand fundamental mechanisms associated to tissue modeling, potentially needing to new therapeutic strategies for different diseases. Thank you for joining us today. And now I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Laura, for the great introduction. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's very nice to see you all virtually. And give me just one second, usually, just to get my screen shared. OK, perfect. So once again, thanks for coming today. And uh, I'm very excited to share a little bit of uh, the research that I, I have been doing the past few years and that I'm starting to carry on here at Carlton. And as you can imagine, today's story, I will take you into a journey that uh, we have different elements from different areas. So we will go from tissue engineering to microscopy, from cellular biology to material science. And I hope you'll find it very interesting. And in a nutshell, my plan today is to share a little bit of uh, what we have been doing in my lab and with uh, several collaborators now at Crowto Inclusive in terms of uh, how can we combine tissue engineering with uh, biophotonics or imaging to, to get a different gamut of uh, information. For example, we can use this information to uh, develop new drugs, new therapies. We can try to find uh, how the basic mechanisms of several diseases is happening. And then that can help us to discover new strategies to treat those, those diseases that sometimes don't have a cure yet. And my talk today is, uh, has four short parts, and uh, I will start giving you a little bit of an introduction 
about uh, the extra cellar matrix, which is the main uh, aspect that I have been mostly interested on. And uh, then I will chat a little bit about uh, the imaging side of things. So how can we take advantage of uh, the amazing pictures that we can get with uh, very special types of microscopes? And then uh, I will talk about uh, how we can extract information from those images. And then I will finish this talk just uh, showing you how we can integrate the, the idea of 3D bioprinting tissue to characterize all these samples and find more information about the, the biological mechanisms. And yeah, so let's uh, get started with uh, from the beginning. So in case you are wondering, in case you don't have a biological background, uh, what exactly is the extracellular matrix, right? So here, I hope you can see my cursor, but uh, on the left side, I have a, a very nice uh, microscopy image of uh, the ECM or the extracellular matrix. So that's basically a, a network of uh, different types of proteins that the cells can use to, to, uh, to, to have a, such as a, like a, a physical scaffold. So they can use the, the ECM as a structure for them to move around, to actually connect to each other. And uh, the ECM also plays a role in terms of uh, promoting some very important uh, biochemical and biomechanical cues for the cells to, to perform their functions in different tissues. So each organ that we have, even if each tissue of the body that we have, they will have a slightly different structure of the ECM. And, And uh, here we have a, a very oversimplified uh, diagram of uh, how the ECM would look like. So we have collagen fibers, elastic fibers. So we have uh, different kinds of proteins and other components in there. Those are all going to be in contact with uh, the, the cell membrane. And uh, today we are going to focus on the collagen fibers that we have in there. So those are, the, are going to be the, the main subject for us into this journey. And uh, the reason I'm going to talk mostly about collagen is because of um, collagen is the most abundant uh, structural protein that we have in, in animals and in the human body as well. So we have more or less 25% of the total protein mass is actually collagen. And uh, just a fun fact, collagen comes from the Greek word kola, which means glue. So basically that's the protein that's allowing us to be Put together so we can hold all the cells together, we can create the structures that form our bodies. And uh, in the human body, for example, we have over 20 types of collagen, actually 28 to be exact. And uh, interesting enough, when we look at collagen, and uh, since it is such an important protein to provide all the support and all the structure that we have in the tissues, we also can notice that uh, quite often when we look at uh, different types of uh, diseases or pathologies that we have happening in different parts of the body, they are going to have a component that's going to be associated with uh, collagen related abnormalities. So for example, if we look at uh, different types of skin disorders, pathologies of the liver, lung diseases, cardiovascular diseases, we are, if we dig deep enough, we are always going to find some changes related to collagen, to the collagen structure in there. So that's um, by itself, it's a very interesting reason, right? To take a look at uh, how all these changes might be playing a role into the cell environment and how, what we can do basically to try to, to solve these, these problems and find a cure, for example, to, to different kinds of diseases. And uh, what makes collagen very special is that uh, it has a very unique uh, structure. So this protein is unique. And uh, here we have a diagram showing uh, how it looks like. So we have uh, what's called uh, the collagen fiber. And uh, imagine a very thick rope. So we would have that big rope. And then to, to make the structure of the rope, we would have uh, a small threads, right? And collagen is more or less, this has the same structure. So inside of the collagen fibers, we would have what's called the collagen fibrils. And then if we look inside of the fibrils, then we will find something that uh, has a structure of a triple helix. Just like the DNA structure, if you remember, we will have something similar to that, where we have the amino acid chains going around and forming this very unique uh, structure in there. So all of this provides uh, collagen the, the very special property of being a, a very strong protein. 
And uh, in a sense, it provides the tensile strength similar to a steel cable. So from there, you can have an idea of uh, how special this protein is. And uh, one interesting aspect of all these types of collagens that we have in the body is that uh, they can be classified into two main groups. So we have one that's called uh, the fibrillar collagens, or as the name says, they make fibers. And then we also have the non-fibrillar ones. The ones that I focus the most in my research are the fibrillar ones. So I'm very interested in knowing what's going on in terms of the, the fiber formation of, uh, of these structures, right, based on the collagen. And uh, usually in biology in different uh, areas, one way that uh, we traditionally look at um, the deposition of collagen tissue, how they are accumulated or what's happening there is based on what's called uh, histological staining. So without going too much details, the idea is here we have uh, some examples of uh, in these images there. And uh, the idea is we can cut very thin sections of uh, tissue, for example. We can add some special chemicals or some special stains that are going to be binding into specific structures of this tissue. Sometimes we can, for example, uh, find specific stains to, to mark where collagen fibers are or elastic fibers are and so on. And uh, so here in the top image, uh, everything that's kind of bluish, greenish is, uh, should be the collagen is stained with this specific um, stain type. And then in the bottom here, for example, the, the blackish thing is uh, our elastic fibers in the tissue. As you can imagine, for us to, to be able to generate images like that or to, to make the tissue look like that, it, uh, it's quite time consuming. So we have to basically follow a very complicated cake recipe. We have to play with a lot of chemicals, prepare the tissue in a way, in a very specific way in order to be able to have these stains marking the specific structures that we would like to. And uh, my research is mostly focused on an alternative way to look into tissue. So I do a lot of uh, work based on what's called a nonlinear optical microscopy. So the idea is we have a special microscope that uh, user uses laser light and uh, we can, without having to add any chemicals, prepare the tissue in any ways, we can actually get information about the structure of the tissue. So here we have, uh, I have an example for you. On the left uh, panel, we have uh, a section. So a very thin slice of uh, lung tissue, one from a normal uh, donor, the other one from asthmatic. And uh, as I said, we can use the, spe uh, the special chemicals to bind to a specific uh, components of this tissue. So we can see the different colors, different structures. And uh, here on the right side, all those images, they are from this uh, special type of microscopy. So the, the second panel, is showing the, the collagen. So without any staining, any preparation, we can actually see the collagen fibers in there. Then we have the elastic fibers and these, the last pictures are just a, a merge of the two images. So we can see the overlap of, uh, of the two structures there, the two proteins in there. And uh, this uh, type of microscopy, it's, uh, it's a very special one. So that's a uh, nonlinear optical microscopy is a, is a family of uh, different techniques and uh, they are based on the interaction of multiple photons to generate the signal that we are going to be detecting. So if we look into a, let's say a regular type of uh, microscopy, usually we are going to be detecting interactions that happens on a one by one. So one photon uh, generating certain amount of signal. When we play with uh, any technique in this family of nonlinear techniques, we are actually taking advantage of uh, the unlikeliness of having two photons interacting at the same time, at the same place with uh, specific parts of the tissue or the sample that we would like to image. So just uh, in case you are familiar, for example, with uh, regular fluorescence that we use quite often in biology labs, um, in normal fluorescence, what happens is we would have uh, photons come into the sample they would uh, have some interaction happening there. And then we would be collecting signal from all over the place where those interactions were happening. When we use nonlinear optical microscopy, uh, we would be detecting signal coming from this very specific region where the two photons would be interacting. So the probability is a little uh, more focused on a very special region, which is called the focal plane. So where the light is really focused on that specific point, that's from where the signal is coming from. And that's where, from where the, our images are going to be generated. 
And uh, there are quite a few different ways to, to get images based on this uh, idea of having multiple photons interacting. But uh, today I would like to focus on one specific one, which is called uh, second harmonic generation. I know the name sounds very complicated, but um, I can explain to you how exactly that can help us to look at uh, the structure of collagen, for example. So the idea is we will still have uh, our fancy microscope. We will need a, a laser source in there. We are going to have uh, different photons interacting with uh, a certain material. In our case, the sample is going to be a biological sample. So a sample that will have collagen there, because remember collagen is making the, it's been the protein responsible for the structure of the tissue. And uh, when we have this laser light interacting with this sample or this uh, tissue or whatever you want to call it, we are going to have uh, uh, a modification into the color of this light or the frequency of the light. And then we can actually detect the light that's going to come off the sample. So for example, we have a laser light that's going to have a certain frequency that in this case here we are calling omega for the sake of having an example. And uh, once this light interacts with uh, structures in the tissue, we are going to be able to detect uh, a certain light that's going to have twice as much the original frequency. So that's very handy for us because then we can set up detectors that uh, we will know what's the frequency of the light that we are shining into the sample. And then by knowing that's going to be exactly double that, we can set up detectors on the other end and collect all the signal that's going to be coming from our sample. And uh, you might be wondering, okay, but uh, how can you know exactly from where this signal is coming from, right? So what's very interesting about uh, second harmonic generation is that uh, this phenomenon, this physical, this physical phenomenon to generate the signal only happens when we have structures which lacks central symmetry, meaning if we have something that if you look the left side and the right side, they look the same, that's not going to be able to generate this uh, secondary wave that we are trying to detect. It only happens if we have something that doesn't have this uh, central symmetry. So if you remember a few slides ago, I showed you that collagen, uh, the fibrillar collagens, they have that triple helix structure, right? And that's exactly the type of uh, structure that we need to generate this kind of signal. So this uh, modality of uh, nonlinear optical microscopy, it's very good for us to image collagen fibers, fibrillar collagen, without uh, any staining. So it's just a natural signal that will come from all the structures that has this triple helix uh, organization. So here is an example of a beautiful collagen network in there. And uh, here is just a, a nice uh, set of pictures for you to look. For example, in this case here, we are looking at uh, an artery. So it's uh, we opened up the, the artery of a rabbit and uh, unfortunately, this rabbit had uh, atherosclerosis. So it's uh, those little bumps here that uh, grow inside of the, 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 the blood vessel. And uh, those bumps, eventually, they will start blocking the blood flow and so on. And uh, so here are some examples of uh, showing how we can take advantage of these different types of uh, nonlinear optical microscopy to look at uh, the composition of these plaques. So I didn't go into too much details about the other techniques, but we can use, for example, fluorescence-based. We can use one that's going to be very specific for imaging lipid-rich cells. And of course, we can use our second harmonic one to look at uh, collagen accumulation. And OK, so now you're all experts in extracellular matrix and microscopy. So we can move on on how can we actually get some information from those images, right? So I guess I convinced you that uh, the images look very nice. They are very good for getting the information that we need. But now we have to find a way to quantify the information that we are seeing. And uh, here I have an example for you showing different types of uh, second harmonic images. So again, that's all collagen, fibrillar collagen. And uh, funny enough, all those images, they were acquired from arteries. So meaning that's from the same type of the tissue, the same type of disease, let's say. But uh, you can notice that there is a huge variability of, uh, in terms of the collagen arrangement in there, right? So we can see that all these images here, they look com completely different. And uh, it would be very nice if we could find a way to take advantage of all these changes and try to find the metrics, right, to, to quantify what's happening inside of the tissues. And um, part of my work is focused on 
actually take advantage of those images and find new ways to classify them depending on the structures that we have in there, in this case, collagen, based on their shapes, on their arrangements. And uh, one of the techniques that I tend to use a lot, especially when dealing with uh, biological applications, is uh, based on what's called texture analysis. So let's go step by step here. So let's suppose we have an image. So now we know how the image is generated. So we have images of collagen fibers in there. And uh, we know that images are made of uh, pixels. So we can have different pixels in there. We usually have different colors, different gray shades or gray levels. And uh, that basically means that each one of the pixels that we have in an image will have a certain number. And uh, we can play with those numbers, right? So we can, for example, calculate what's called the first order statistics. So we can, for example, calculate the mean value that we have of the intensity. We can calculate the standard deviation that we have in a certain area of the image. And uh, we can correlate all of this to the amount of collagen that we are detecting. That's very nice, but sometimes we will have situations like this example that I have there. So imagine that we can calculate, for example, the mean of, uh, of an image. So we are going to basically add and divide all the intensities that we are detecting and then try to differentiate the, the images that we collected. If we look at this example here, we can see that the, the pattern that we have in there is different, but we um, if we calculate the mean, we will get the same number because in this case here, we have exactly half of the pixels black, half of the pixels white. And uh, this is not going to tell us anything about how they are arranged. So it's not going to be very helpful in terms of looking at uh, the structure that we will have in our images, right? And we can solve that problem by using one different strategy, and uh, the name is uh, gray level concurrence matrix. I'm not going to go into too much details about this, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you have in the end. But uh, in a nutshell, the idea is once we have the image, we have the numbers in each one of the pixels, we can look at uh, how they are related to each other in terms of the intensity. So we can look, for example, if we have a black pixel here, do we have a black pixel uh, directly besides it, above, below, et cetera, et cetera. When we look at, uh, let's say, a gray pixel, does it have a neighbor that's also gray, white, black, and so on and so forth? So we can create a map or a matrix that's going to tell us how many pixels of each one of these colors have uh, neighbors of all other colors. So we can create a matrix that's going to tell us the combinations or the patterns that uh, we have happening in our images. So we are considering the relationship between the pixels neighbors. And that's going to allow us to track structural changes that happens in the images. So for example, in my case that uh, I'm very interested in collagen, it's going to allow me to look into the morphology of these fibers, for example. And uh, there are lots of metrics that we can calculate from these images. And uh, I'm not going to bother you with all the equations and the mathematical details, but uh, here some are, some are some of the options that we have. And uh, one very nice example that's very easy to visualize is uh, the one called entropy. If you remember physics, uh, entropy here has the same uh, definition. So we are looking at uh, the lack of organization that we have in an image. So if we go back to our uh, previous example, we are if we calculate the entropy of those images, we are going to be looking at uh, how disorganized those pixels are, right? So in this case here, this uh, image there would, uh, for example, get uh, the highest uh, entropy score because uh, we can see the pixels here are less organized than they were in the, in the previous image. So that's, uh, that's a very interesting matrix, for example, that we can use and uh, obtain some uh, information from the images that we are collecting. Okay, so that brings me to the third part of my talk. That's uh, I'm going to tell you how we can combine image analysis and microscopy to try to answer some interesting biological questions. And uh, the example that I have for you today is about uh, asthma. Just uh, in one slide explaining what exactly asthma is, is that uh, we have, when we, you, when we have asthma, what happens is 
certain changes in our airways, in our uh, lungs are going to happen. And that's going to be because certain triggers. So different people might have different triggers. Some people may have uh, their asthma flared up because uh, they are exposed to cold air, to dust, to let's say cat hair or something. And uh, so one of those triggers, they are going to be uh, causing an uh, inflammatory response. So that's going to tell your cell, the cells in your body that, hey, something wrong, wrong is happening there. We have to do something. We have to repair the injury that's happening. And uh, that's what's going to be causing the airway to narrow. And therefore, the person is going to have some difficulties breathing. And uh, one sad part about asthma is that uh, although we do have some uh, strategies to relieve the, the symptoms, there is no cure yet. Although it's a very common disease, I'm sure you probably know someone who has asthma or maybe yourself has have asthma. And uh, so we do have those, um, those um, uh, medications that we can use to relieve the symptom when you really cannot breathe, breathe well, but uh, there is no way we can address the, the changes happening in the tissue and uh, find a cure. And uh, I spent quite a few years and I'm um, still looking into understanding what exactly is going on inside of uh, the airways in terms of uh, the tissue changes and uh, how can we try to find what's going to be the best target for new medications to be developed, right? So clearly we can alleviate the symptoms, but we don't know for sure what's exactly going, to, what's exactly causing these changes and uh, triggering all these, uh, these um, problems that are happening inside of the airways. So here I have a, a very simplified diagram just to illustrate some of the steps involved in the, in the asthma uh, remodeling per se. So remodeling is the change in the tissues. And uh, so, like I said, we have some triggers that are going to activate the immune response in, in the body. And uh, that uh, immune, immune response is going to start triggering some, uh, for example, it's going to start having cells recruited to the site of injury. And uh, that are going to lead to several chemicals to be released and different cells are going to come to the site. And uh, that's eventually is going to cause some special type of cells, which are the ones that make a lot of collagen, to try to repair or create some scar tissue in there in an, an attempt to protect this tissue that's been damaged because of the triggers. And uh, here in this figure, we have a, a cross section of an airway. So the airway is a tube. And uh, here I have a cartoon showing. If it is normal, it should look like this. So completely open, uh, unobstructed, the air should be able to flow in and out, no problem. But uh, when we have asthma and different other uh, respiratory diseases, we might have something like this happening. So there is this narrowing happening because of all the tissue that starts to be accumulated in the airway wall. And uh, this is a cross section of a real airway from two different donors, uh, from two different subjects. One uh, was normal, so we can see all the structure here very nicely. We can see the epithelial cells and uh, everything that's in blue-ish is collagen. So you can see when you compare with the asthmatic one, how much collagen it starts to be accumulated in, inside of the airway wall compared to, to a normal person, right? We can see this uh, muscle mass also being uh, developed in there. The presence of mucus becomes quite significant. And all of this is blocking the, the passage of air inside of the airways. And uh, like I said, when uh, the, inflama the inflammation starts to happen because of the triggers, eventually one of the cells that are going to be uh, called to that site of the injury site is, uh, is a special cell that's called the fibroblast. So this cell is the main responsible for uh, making collagen. So they produce a lot of collagen and they are the ones associated to fibrosis. So if you heard about fibrosis, that's basically when you have the fibroblasts producing a huge amount of collagen, way more than we need to repair any site of injury. So for example, when you cut your arm and uh, you have uh, that cut in there, after a few days, eventually you will notice that a uh, scar is going to be built up. And uh, that's basically sim oversimplifying the process. Eventually the, the fibroblasts will come to the site, they will start making more collagen and that's going to allow the, the skin tissue to be repaired. And uh, if you have uh, those scars that look like a little more bumpy, 
and are not so nicely uh, clean. That uh, that's because of uh, we have a little bit of a, a fibrotic tissue being developed there as well. And uh, one interesting part about uh, the fibroblasts is that uh, they are really sensitive to different stimuli. So those stimuli can be mechanical or chemical. So if we have inflammation, that's going to be the chemical cue for these cells to come and start making collagen. But uh, at the same time, when we have more collagen being produced, as you can imagine, we are also changing the mechanical properties of the tissue, right? So the tissue is going to become a little more rigid than it should, and that's going to alter this environment of the cells. And they are going to be receiving more cues of, okay, my environment is changing, so that means I, pro I probably should make more collagen. So as you can see, we enter in a little bit of a crazy circle there, that uh, we have inflammation happening that's going to be triggering this fibrotic response. And then the fibrosis is going to be altering the environment that's going to, in most of the cases, cause more inflammation, which is going again to lead to more fibrosis and so on. So basically this, um, this mechanism there, it's not well understood yet. So we don't know for sure if inflammation is the one that's causing the fibrosis, or if it is fibrosis, that's going to be triggering most of the inflammation. So that's uh, what we call a million dollar question, because uh, as you can imagine, if we solve this puzzle, if we find out what's exactly uh, going on in all the steps around this uh, oversimplified diagram, that's going to allow us to find the cure for so many diseases that have this fibrotic response as one of the main hallmarks. And uh, so one of the questions that I have been very focused on is in terms of uh, what's happening to this microenvironment of the fibroblasts, right? So since we are changing the structure in there, how is that triggering the responses? And uh, once again, um, uh, I have been spending a lot of time combining different types of imaging technologies, including the nonlinear optical microscopy that I told you about before, and uh, all those image-based metrics to try to find out uh, changes in terms of the cells, the collagen fibers they are making, and so on. On the left side, I have an example of a beautiful image showing two fibroblast cells, and uh, everything in blue is uh, our collagen fibers. So you can see the cells making collagen there, and uh, here we can have a better sense of how they are interacting and how they might be modifying the, the environment. And uh, in terms of uh, what's happening inside of the, the asthma airways, I, I worked for quite a few years in a study, in a very large study, that we were looking at uh, how collagen was changing inside of the, the airways, right? And uh, it was very interesting because based on, again, microscopy and image analysis, it was possible to notice that uh, when we look at uh, the collagen fibers from asthma, we noticed that... Uh, we had higher intensity of second harmonic signal, which was not big news. We knew from histology and from other methods that uh, collagen was more accumulated in there. But uh, then a new piece of information came around. So calculating that uh, entropy parameter that I told you before, we noticed that uh, the collagen fibers were less organized in asthma when compared to controls. And that was a new piece of information. That was something that nobody had uh, looked before we, we started this study. So that was very interesting. We started looking at uh, how the fibers were organized, the orientation and so on. Here I have some examples showing, for example, how the, the control compares to the asthma in terms of the collagen arrangement. In the controls, we have very nice fibers organized. And then when we look into asthmatic, we can see all these fragments and uh, they, they lose basically the structure. Based on the images that I showed you from second harmonic generation, we can also calculate, for example, the thickness of these collagen fibers, which was not different comparing asthma and controls. I looked at uh, the fiber spacing, so how far between them from each other they were. And now uh, we noticed that uh, the ones in asthma, they were more spread out than the ones in, in controls. And uh, that all led to a very big question, which was, why are collagen fibers more disorganized in asthma, right? So what's going on in there? And uh, that led to a second part of, uh, of this very interesting work, which was we started to try to develop some little models, some tissue models to simulate the environment of, uh, that the cells find inside of the airways. 
So we, we build some, uh, it's called a collagen gels. So basically the idea is we create a, a matrix, an artificial matrix. We put the cells in there and then we see how they behave. So we added cells from normal people and cells from asthmatic subjects. And uh, we observed what the cells made with uh, this matrix of collagen. And uh, it was very interesting because when we added normal cells, they were able to make the nice collagen fibers. They were able to remodel the collagen, as we say, and uh, all the structure looked really nice. But then when we looked at the asthmatic ones, they were not able to make the nice fibers. And that can be seen because we don't see the signal from second harmonic generation, right? The one that uh, we, that I showed you before, that we need that special fiber structure to, to show up. And uh, so that got some evidence to us in terms of, okay, so maybe these fibroblasts from asthma, they are not behaving the way they should. And uh, therefore they are not able to contract the, the, the collagen as, uh, as expected. And that led us to ask another question, which was, okay, so let's look at the cells it's themselves. So are they looking normal? They, do they have any defects in terms of their cytoskeleton? Are they having any issues moving around the matrix to remodel this collagen and to communicate with each other? Making a very long story short, we tested several proteins and genes and we couldn't find anything that was telling us that the, the cytoskeleton of the fibroblast was different when we looked into the asthmatic ones versus the control ones. And that was very puzzling because uh, we were sure that we were going to find something that would indicate some uh, problems with these cells, right? And uh, then again, fast forwarding many months of uh, very intensive research and testing, we eventually found one big piece of, in this puzzle which was the whole problem of uh, related to remodeling the collagen seems to be related to the capacity of these fibroblast cells to um, express one specific protein that's called decrin. Again, without going into too much details, the idea is uh, decrin is a special protein that's going to be found uh, attached to the collagen fibrils. So if you remember the structure that we had for the collagen fibers, we have the fibers, we have the fibrils, and uh, we have a protein there that's going to basically dictate how far apart those fibrils are going to be placed inside of the fiber. So if you imagine again, the thick rope, imagine that you cannot place all these fibrils the way they should. So therefore you cannot build the rope, right? And uh, so that was exactly the evidence that we found in this study. And uh, that was um, uh, double checked by using another type of microscopy images, which uh, is called transmission electron microscopy. So we could see, for example, in the control case, we found we were looking inside of the collagen fiber. So looking inside of the collagen fiber, that's what we could see. And uh, in the controls, we had all the fibrils very nicely aligned, all organized. And then when we looked at uh, the asthmatic ones, it was a, a mess. So that was, uh, again, another evidence corroborating to the conclusion that we got from this study that uh, yes, the fibroblasts, they are defective at uh, packing this fibrillar collagen because of uh, lower expression of the decrin. And everything was all nice and beautiful, but uh, one big limitation of this study was that uh, we were looking at uh, what's called 2D cultures. It's uh, basically we had cells growing in this dish with uh, the collagen matrix in there. And uh, we know by a fact that they do not behave uh, the same way they behave in tissue when they are, uh, they don't have the freedom to, uh, to move around in, in three dimensions, right? So that uh, is where we can combine a new strategy, which is uh, called, the one that I explored the most is called a 3D bioprinting. So this is the idea is we are going to recreate a 3D environment where the cells can walk around in different dimensions and therefore hopefully behave the same way they behave in, in tissue. And uh, this is the last part of my talk. And uh, now I'm going to show you a few examples that uh, of some of the work that we are doing related to integrating now 3D bioprinting with imaging to, again, understand what's going on in terms of all these changes that happens inside of the tissue when we have uh, certain responses. And uh, just to illustrate, 
and how different things look like. And uh, here we have a rendering of uh, a tumor microenvironment. And uh, here is how we normally look at a tumor when we do this, this 2D cell cultures. So we have basically cells growing on a plate and uh, you can for sure see that uh, the, the structure there is completely different than what we would like to have if we were to achieve the same arrangements that we have in, in real life. And uh, when we go to 3D cultures, 3D models, we are a little closer to have this representation of the, the complex environment that the cells have. And uh, one of the areas that um, my research group and a lot of collaborators that we are exploring is uh, we are trying to, first of all, can we recreate the synthetic or the artificial extracellular matrix in a way that uh, these fibroblast cells will behave similar to what they behave in real tissue, right? So from there, we can also take a look at uh, how the, the, the cells are being affected by the microenvironment, because then we can construct all these models in a very specific way. We can change the components, we can change the mechanical properties, we can add chemicals in there to lead some responses. And uh, so we can explore different types of uh, aspects related to, to the mechanisms involved in the cellular differentiation, communication, and so on. And uh, so here is a picture of uh, how one 3D bioprinter looks like. This one is actually uh, coming to Crowton soon. So we will have a lab up and running sooner rather than later. And uh, this is a microfluidics based one. And uh, the idea is we can mix all kinds of proteins and cells in there and create the, the 3D structure that we need to, to address any question that we would like to. And uh, one example that I can give you again, related to asthma. So we can just like uh, engineers or architects uh, play with uh, CAD softwares building the, the structures, pieces, and coming up with uh, all kinds of forms and designs, we can do the same thing with uh, 3D bioprinting. So we can design structures with uh, different layers of materials, and uh, we can add different types of cells in there, depending on the application that we would like to look. And uh, that allows us to define the, the conditions that we need for whatever question that we are looking at. In this example here, the idea was to build an uh, airway, and uh, in this case, we were looking at uh, how could we mimic the environment in terms of the contraction of the airway, right? So we had this, the red part is just a support material because if we don't have those and we add the cells able to contract, they just contract and make uh, the whole blue structure into a little blob. So one of the challenges in terms of design was to come up with the idea of adding some inert material at the top and the bottom to provide some sort of uh, support. When the cells contracted the blue part, they were still in place in a ring shape. And again, using microscopy, we can look at how the cells are changing, how everything is changing in there. And the uh, imaging is still a big part. So we, are, we can create, for example, chemical maps of uh, the dip different parts of the tissues. We can look at uh, the chemical responses that are happening there. And uh, one very interesting work that I, I have happening right now is in terms of, uh, we are looking at different compositions of uh, bioinks. So that means we can mix and match cells and proteins and whatever we want and uh, explore how that's affecting the cell behavior. So here I have an example for you. We have just different concentrations of collagen and fibronectin, which are two of the main proteins of uh, the extracellular matrix. That's just a very simplified model. We added some fibroblasts in there and we looked at uh, how they responded to just changing the concentrations of proteins. As you can see, everything in green are the cells and uh, they seem to be much happier in this last uh, uh, model here in this last uh, bioink because they are presenting this nice elongated shape. So they seem to be remodeling some collagen there on their own. And uh, for example, if we look at the first one, it's, uh, we see just a little fragment of collagen all over the place. This one, just by looking at the picture of the model, we can see the structure is not holding up. So the cells cannot do much. They are not able to remodel the collagen and so on. And uh, just uh, my last slide here is um, another aspect that we are also working on. This one in collaboration with uh, researchers from the NRC here in Ottawa and also the, the company that uh, one company in Canada 
that makes these uh, 3D bioprinters. We are looking to building a hollow tube structure to, to simulate uh, the structure that we have in an airway. So the idea is we want to print something that's going to be hollow, and then we are going to have air being perfused in there to simulate exactly the environment that we would have for the cells in a, in a real airway. And uh, this is just a uh, one preliminary image that we got. So this big structure here is the, the tube. And uh, we have all the cells in here already kind of taking over the, the structure of the wall of this tube. And uh, here is just uh, this little square is this one amplified. And we can see evidence of the extracellular matrix being built in there. And moving forward, uh, for the plan for the next few years, many, many years, I guess, it's, uh, we have a big mission here. So we are looking to find the optimum balance between the biocompatibility and the printability. So as you can see, what allows us to print nice structures, not necessarily is the one that the cells like the most. And uh, if we find something that's ideal for the cells, it's usually very challenging to come up with a ways to hold up that structure and uh, build the, the the scaffolds that we need, for example. And uh, yeah, so basically that's uh, the next steps moving forward for my research. And uh, that's very interesting because uh, in order to achieve that, of course, I cannot do that all alone. So I'm very glad to be here in this environment where we can have people with different expertise from different departments working together, all focused on a common cause. We are all trying to understand how the tissue structure is changing from different points of views. And uh, we have several projects going on, collaboratively speaking, under the, the umbrella of uh, the Tissue Engineering and Materials uh, Hub. And yeah, so that's what I had to share with you today. And I hope you enjoyed. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Perfect. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Uh, lots of inform information presented for sure. Um, so we do have a few questions that have come in through the Q&A box. So thank you to everyone who has submitted. If you have other questions, please don't hesitate to type them into the Q&A box. Um, so our first question. So can you image keratin fibers as well? And if yes, how do you distinguish between these different fibers in a tissue? That's an excellent question. So uh, I didn't go into too much details of, um, of exactly how this technique works. And uh, I, have, I have to disclose, I'm not a, I don't know exactly how the structure of keratin looks like, but as long as we have uh, non-central symmetry, it should be, we should be able to image. In terms of uh, biological tissue, the, I suspect keratin might not fulfill all the requirements because uh, most of the times the, the signal is always coming from either collagen one or collagen three. And uh, the distinction between collagen one and three is not always possible, of course, because they are very similar in terms of their fibrillary structure. And uh, there has been some examples of people imaging DNA, for example, that also has that uh, triple helix and uh, it's possible the signal is much lower than collagen, but it is possible to image those as well. In terms of keratin, I will own you that answer. I have to, to double check exactly. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, next question. So what is the main difference between 3D printing and 3D bioprinting? Okay, yeah, so... 3D printing, I guess most of people are familiar with. It's, uh, it involves, uh, for example, adding some plastic artificial materials into a, a printer uh, nozzle. And then you melt that plastic and then you can basically build anything you would like to based on a design. The 3D bioprinting works in essence very similar, if not equally, as a 3D printer. And uh, the only difference is that instead of using, let's say plastic, we are using um, biological materials. As I said in my talk, we can use all kinds of uh, different proteins. We use uh, hydrogels, we can use silk, agarose, and all kinds of um, materials that uh, to build these structures that we need. And we can add cells in there as well. One thing that we have to keep in mind is that uh, we have to find 
materials that are going to be uh, allow the cells, be, first of all, to survive and also to behave the way they should. So, of course, we cannot use plastic because the cells will die, but uh, it's, uh, it's the same principle. The only thing is that we are going to be focusing on using biomaterials or bio-friendly materials to, to build our structures. Thank you. Um, next question. So in addition to decorin, are other proteoglycans, I apologize if that is the wrong pronunciation, involved in asthma pathogenesis? There are lots. And uh, we did the screen for several of them. And uh, decorin was the one that uh, really popped up. So the, the research continues. It's not a definite answer by any means, but uh, we're still looking into different aspects and different biomarkers now uh, based on uh, Roman spectroscopy, for example. And we are trying to identify a few other indicators of uh, that might be the main players in the, the remodeling that we see in asthma. Right. Next question. Um, so how were the lung samples of the 11 year old obtained to be inspected under the nonlinear microscope? Okay, that, yeah, that's a great question. Maybe I, I wasn't clear enough, but uh, those samples are actually obtained from deceased patients. So they are donors and uh, their families, they, they fill up a, a consent to donate their lungs for research. And that uh, comes from the lung registry at uh, UBC in Vancouver. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, a way to do these kind of measurements in vivo yet. And uh, all the images that I showed uh, from airways, they are from uh, deceased uh, patients. All right, thank you. Next question. Um, so do you also look into the inflammatory responses um, in asthma and their role in remodeling? That's something that I'm slowly transitioning to, partially also thanks to amazing collaborators that I found here at Carlton. That's something that has been on the radar, of course, because uh, like I showed, the, the two responses go hand in hand, the fibrotic response and the inflammatory one. My focus so far has been greatly on the, the fibrosis side, but uh, yeah, we are starting now to explore the, the inflammatory responses. Great, thank you. Um, right. So how do you ensure you are imaging um, fibrillar collagen and not other types of collagen? Yeah, like I, I said before, uh, we can ensure that uh, the, co the collagen that we are looking at, they are most of the time collagen type one. They Sometimes they are collagen type three. So those are fibrillar. And the reason is that we can ensure that uh, only fibrillar collagens are being made imaged is because of uh, the chemical structure. So the, the way the, the molecules are arranged within the, the fibers. And uh, we don't find the same uh, lack of centrosymmetry in uh, non-fibrillar collagen. So therefore we cannot get any of the second harmonic signal from those. And uh, But we do, we, we cannot be 100% sure if we are picking up signal from one type of fibrillar collagen versus another. But um, Fibrillar versus non-fibrillar is okay to, to be sure about. <laughs> Great. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have covered all the questions that got submitted. Um, lots of thank yous in the chat. Um, great thank talk <laughs> and whatnot. Um, so yes, thank you so much um, for joining us today and presenting. Um, on this very interesting topic. And thank you to our audience for taking the time out of your day to join us. So we are just going to pop up a brief survey onto the screen. If you do have the time to fill it out, um, we'd really appreciate that. Um, here we go. And you can see also ways to stay connected with the Faculty of Engineering and Design. So our next Ingenious Talk event will be in 2022 on January the 19th. So we do hope that we will see you then.
um, yeah, fill out the survey if you do have the time. Answers are anonymous. And thank you and stay safe. Hope to see you all again soon.